are going to die. Great news for Easter, right? And that brings us a certain element of anxiety. But although we're going to experience a time... Oh! Oh, the video froze. <laughs> oh, did it? Yeah, it was very choppy on our end. I didn't see it flow, uh, you know, seamlessly. But, man, this is going to be an interesting one. We are doing some interreligious dialogue tonight. We're going to do dialogue. And we have to be careful not to make it dialogue for the sake of dialogue, because that's something we rip on all the right. time. Right. That's nothing you ever do. Talk to talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, all right. A couple of things. Let's see. Um there's probably one or two ways this is going to go tonight. It's either going to be uh, Zoomer and me and Rob are going to proselytize the Easterner over here and beat the Byzantianity <laughs> out of them, or <laughs> it's going to be Zoomers versus Millennials and me and Rob are in trouble tonight. So we'll <laughs> we should have called our uh, our uh, our Zoomer in just in case. Oh, yeah, Nick? you should have. You should have. The traditional Thomas, Nick. Come oh on. yeah, from, oh we should have got him in. Well, I get what right. Anthony's talking about. I was before. considering it too, actually. I was like, let's get let's get our own resident Zoomer in here. Um, yeah. all right. So real quick, we had we had Mario on last week, and we got his backstory a little bit. But Zoomer, we really don't have yours. I'm gonna give you. I I first came across you when I was watching a Ruslan video, and he hmm. featured your church history video. Now you had like four thousand subs at the time. Yeah, like your channel was tiny, and I just watched your channel skyrocket. Now I really did enjoy your church history video. I thought it was really well done. It's I, it was the first time I ever heard like a Protestant come at it from like a a, a good like it was like oh wow that's actually what happened you know so um, what was what what were you raised as like give us like a snapshot like we don't want to do conversion story tonight but like give us a snapshot where you came from how you became Christian where you started and how you kind of got where you are now. Yeah, so my family's religious history is complicated, but all you need to know is that I was not raised in a Christian environment. I was raised in an environment that was very secular, very left-wing, very Jewish-influenced. Uh, everyone knows I have part Jewish heritage, as my nose indicates. So <laughs> my heritage was anything but based. And I came across Christianity when I went to a music camp in the Midwest. I mean, I knew what Christianity was, but that's when I actually interacted with Christians who actually believed in Christianity. Where I'm okay. from in New York, if you say you're Christian or, you, or you're Jewish, all that means is do you open your presents on Christmas or Hanukkah? You, you don't actually believe the stuff. That's like yeah. for, you know, witches in the 1600s. Uh, but I was exposed to like, you know, devout Christianity. I visited the Midwest, came back home. And I just joined my local Presbyterian church, and I've been a Presbyterian ever since. So that's where in New York are you? Are you still in New York? Well, I study in Texas, but I was from the New York City metro area, so not the city, but right outside the city. Because I live on Long Island, like I'm, I and I work in I work in the city every day. Like I work yeah. in <laughs> work in the five boroughs. So I'm, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm from from Westchester. Okay, so you're the, you're the northern suburbs. I'm the out eastern yeah. suburbs. Oh, that's yeah. that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um. Yeah, so what, what what first made me want to talk to you is uh, your reaction to Mario's parody video of you, right? So <clears throat> Mario makes parody videos, and watching how somebody reacts to his parody is very telling about somebody because somebody's either going to pretend they didn't see it and get all butthurt about it. You retweeted it and laughed about it, and I was like, all right, this is somebody we can have a conversation with. Well, yeah, it's like... Um... I, I'm sure you guys don't know this, but I'm actually building a stained glass icon of Carl Bart, and I'm going to venerate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did know. I did know. I have my informants. They let me know of it right before the stream. Yeah, P Pastor Susan consecrated it, and <laughs> that's what really matters. It's big news. No, that was, that was definitely cool. I mean, because I've made a few parodies of a lot of people, and uh, yours was the first one where uh, – the person reacted like super positively towards it. And since then I've made more parodies and people that I've made parodies of have laughed at it. So it's encouraging to see besides Jay Dyer, Jay Dyer, like the ones I did of him. If it's funny, it's based. <laughs> did yeah. you see his, did you see his Mike Winger church history video? Zoomer, did you see Mario's church? He did a, he did a church history video from Mike Winger where it's like, it's yeah, like, uh, <laughs> I sort of limit myself to the chill streams and the parody videos for now, 
but you know, I'm not I'm not quite an apologist, but I do I do like to dunk on people for uh, quick likes. And you've been my uh, you've been my victim many times on Twitter, and I've been yours. You've ratioed me many times, you know. So I have I don't I don't pay attention to that, but I you should keep making parody videos because they're funny. I think satire and parody is actually a very good way to communicate. Um, like that's why yeah, I love like the, the Lutheran satire channel on YouTube and stuff. Yeah, I yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do uh, sort of something similar to what Hans does over there on Lutheran Satire. Big you fan should. of his. Yeah, yeah, Mario, you got a lot of love for you for for the evangelicals because you kind of come from that background. Like you grew up Baptist, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, I grew up Baptist. Me. Grew up evangelical. Grew up singing oceans. You know the draw. <laughs> Wait, so, so so did you go through the typical progression like evangelical to Presbyterian to Ang Lutheran to Catholic or something? <laughs> no, I skipped I skipped the um the, the Anglo Lutheran phase. Okay, so you were a bit on you were on the fast track. I was on the fast track. I, I went from evangelical to caring about infant baptism. And then I met Matthew Pearson. He's one of my best friends. I think you've met him before as well. Yeah. I was on um, a show once. Yeah, yeah, and uh, he played a role in me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a funny <laughs> word. <laughs> yeah, and so Matthew um, reached out to me, and then I started going to a Presbyterian church, and then from there I started inquiring into orthodoxy. How much – I'm, I'm going to try to do, like, the, 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 the meme face of me that's always used. How much stained glass did that Presbyterian church have? I didn't have any stained glass, but it yeah, wasn't that's very. Why you converted to orthodoxy? If it was, if it was just a prettier church, you would have seen the beauty of traditional Presbyterianism. It's if so it was true. Prettier, it's so true. Yeah, they were they were one icon short of keeping me. No, it's not about icons. I don't like those. But if, if there was, <laughs> I like those. If, if the windows <laughs> like, no, were, no. yeah, that, that's too far. That's too far. But if the windows were just more colorful, that would have your theology would be different. Yeah, I could have done it. Could have done it. Well, okay, so Zuma, we had a, um, me and I. Well, I don't know if you even remember it was me, but we were we had an interaction about the chosen because you had said the chosen you thought was idolatry or something along those lines, and I I think that chosen is problematic as well. I don't. I wouldn't say it's idolatry, but I say I would say there's a danger of the person watching developing a personal relationship with Jonathan Rumi instead yeah. of Jesus, right? I can't forget if I said it's idolatry. Maybe I said something on Twitter because everyone's more extreme on Twitter than they are in reality. Uh, I don't think every image of Christ is necessarily idolatry. I think if you are not careful, it leads to that often. And I'm just not comfortable with looking at a man, a human actor, and associating a face that's not Jesus with God, basically. So that's why it's like, I'd rather not have any images of Jesus, but I think the less detailed it is, the more okay it is. So like a, a Byzantine icon of Jesus, I think I like the way Byzantine icons work where they're intentionally not super detailed. Whereas mm -hmm. like Roman Catholic statues are, are can be very detailed, but I think the worst from an icona skeptic, iconoclast perspective would be the a human actor actually playing Jesus. I think that's like the highest level of what we're trying to avoid okay so did you ever watch uh mel gibson's the passion yeah and it's like i enjoyed it but i'm still just not comfortable watching a human actor play god yeah that movie would be like semi-liturgical for me like i watch that movie every good friday with my family that movie is like uh i i don't see jim caviezel when i watch that somehow i don't know how but i don't it's see a great, jim it's a great movie yeah I'm not well, saying there's any like, bad the difference that sticks out to me is the fact that in that film, like Jesus's script is very much reduced to like what he says in scripture. And there's not much kind of going off and like inventing new things to say. Whereas in the chosen, it's like Jesus is very quirky. You know, he's got like his own like sort of evangelical friendly uh, personality going on where he's like, huh, well, that's Peter, you know, and it's like the, the one wow. scene, the one scene where he's talking with the apostles and he's like, he's like racking his brain. He's like, I'm really trying to write this sermon and get this sermon right. Like he's a Protestant pastor. I'm like, I, I, I was so angry while that was going on because it's so Protestant to me. And in the green room, we actually, we said this, like there's, there's something going on right now where uh, your generation, like the Zoomers and 
and younger are looking for something a little deeper than your uh, shallow Protestant. Uh, I just got my Bible. I don't need church. I could just, you know, it's just me and Jesus kind of thing. And it's a very interesting thing to watch happen, especially as an older person, seeing these young kids like having these theological arguments. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. I am just as against like evangelicalism and non-denominationalism as the orthobros and trad Catholics are. Uh, part of Operation Reconquista, yes, it is about um, calling the mainline churches to repentance to turn back to Christ. But it's also telling it's also telling people to leave like evangelicalism and go back to traditional Protestantism yeah. because traditional Protestant is so much closer to Catholicism and Orthodoxy than evangelicalism. Evangelicalism is a modern iteration of the Anabaptists who are completely rejected by all the reformers. It's a weird fusion of Anabaptist theology with American individualism and capitalism. And that's how you get, um, that's how you get pizza hut church. That's how you get Hillsong. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like it's funny because, you know, obviously we're in different sides of the aisle theologically, but I, I have a really warm spot for the evangelicals. I like them a lot and I don't I know. I don't know what it is. No, but like not just as people, like I, I feel like their sort of uh, their attitude is something that's like I don't know, very like they get it in a way. They they really get that it's about relationship with Christ. That you need to know Jesus. That you need to have personal devotion. You need to spend time doing Bible studies, stuff like that. That I think is really good. They just sort of lose me with what their actual church services consist of and what they actually hold to theologically. But their attitude, I like. Right. I think individually, like they're, I, we have the distinction between the visible and invisible church. I would not question whether they're true Christians, whether they're part of the invisible church. I would say their institutions are just, their legitimacy is very questionable if they're true churches at all. I think for the most part, they're not. So I'd say we need the passion that these evangelical individuals have in the old, crusty, stale mainline churches to revive them. And I honestly don't blame people for becoming Catholic and Orthodox. I, it makes me sad that Protestantism is dying, but I don't blame them because people are looking for something that's holistically traditional, something that's conservative and traditional. Evangelical Protestants are conservative, but not traditional. And mainline Protestants are traditional, but not conservative. So until we have some sort of reconquista where we combine the two once again, we should expect people to keep leaving Protestantism. So, so I, you see, I figured I can, I can have a conversation with someone like you because you're someone who will say, okay, Mary is the Theotokos, right? You'll recognize that if you don't hold that opinion, you're actually denying Christ's divinity. It's heretical. So, and there's prominent evangelicals like John MacArthur who are historians who say Mary's did not give birth to God. He says it's heretical to call the blood of Jesus, the blood of God. And I also tend to affirm the perpetual virginity as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So like, while you'll affirm that doctrine, you'll still think it's a little weird where Catholics go with it. Right. With mother, with Theotokos? With or... Yeah. Like you'll, you'll see devotion to Mary from a Catholic. Like that's still pretty alien to you though. Right. We, yeah, we, we don't, um, vet, we don't pray to ask Mary for intercession. We don't do that. So we don't accept all the Marian dogmas. Theotokos for sure. Uh, the perpetual virginity is like probably, but there's, yeah, you're right. There's definitely a lot of things. Uh, with uh, Mary and the saints in Catholicism and Orthodoxy that Protestants just don't do. Um, it's not like well, I know, I know Protestants do. don't, but I mean you, like, because you seem, all right, I can have a conversation with you because you're somebody that's actually thinking deeper about these topics. I'm not going to be accused of idolatry or I'm not going to be called a pain. Like, like uh, Mario's church history video of Mike Winger is basically like, the Christian church is the biblical church of biblicalness until it, Constantine mixes Christianity with paganism. Yeah. And it's like that. It's just a very superficial understanding of actual church history right, where it seems yeah. like you actually, even though you, you may think we go too far with something. I think you're grasping the concept of what we're doing still. Right. Of course. I know that it's not praying. It's not worshiping Mary. It's, asking Mary to, to pray for you. Same with the saints. What Gavin Ortland calls it, and I agree with his perspective on this, is he calls it, we see it as accretions. It's like things that started out as something innocent and built like sort of snowballed over time, like a snowball rolling down the hill. And the Reformation was just pruning some of those practices. So it's not like the early church was the Bible believe in Bible church. And then Constantine came along and invented Roman Catholicism and who knows about Orthodoxy. Uh, it's, 
and th that's what most evangelicals think. Uh, they think Constantine invented Catholicism. Who knows what orthodoxy is? Who knows what oriental orthodoxy is? It's probably Muslim. And um, Martin Luther was probably a Baptist because, you know, he's cool and stuff. That's what they think. When the Da Vinci Code came out years and years ago, I remember that was one of the first things that got evangelicals thinking about church history in my life, at least, was yeah. um, when Hollywood came out and they sort of um, cast a lot of skepticism on, you know, the legitimacy of the Christian understanding of Jesus and, you know, what Constantine did and, you know, how church history looks. And I remember evangelicals, like, taking it very seriously. And at, at this mega church that I grew up in, there were definitely uh, men that were like reading books about Da Vinci Code and like sort of rediscovering right. Nicene, and it was sort right. of a funny thing because like, my first exposure to uh, church history, one of my first exposures, was through the Da Vinci Code because the Da Vinci Code slandered Christianity, and then a bunch of evangelicals started like you know looking into history to defend themselves. Right. I mean, I guess that's a good thing. It's like you need to rely on tradition to so that that's sort of a, a shield against these weird conspiracy theories that what we now know of as Christianity was invented by Constantine or by pagans or by who knows what it's like. If you don't know church history, you're living in a fantasy world. Everyone needs to be rooted in church history. Uh, and that's why I say I'd, I'd rather be Roman Catholic than non -denom I'd rather be Eastern Orthodox than non-denominational because I, I would not subject myself to a, uh, a group of people who do not know what they are talking about. Yeah. Even if my main, even if my mainline pastors are heretical, at least they know the church history. They just reject it. Um. What? All right. So, what makes you start reading the church fathers? Because you, I see you posting a lot of church father <laughs> quotes. Like now, Especially now Dustin. there's there's two different ways to read church fathers. One is you cherry pick the fathers to kind of fit your theology, where you're looking at it through a Protestant lens, and the other is to just go, okay, well. Let me let me take myself back to this early Christian church where these men are writing. Like I, I, I'm curious to know: Are you actually just reading the original writings that they wrote, or are you going through the Protestant website that's telling you how it affirms your theology? Now I am. Now I've started reading. Like I do, I read a different church father every Sunday. That's what I do every Sabbath. Beforehand, like when I made my church history video, I hadn't really read primary sources from the church fathers. I read Athanasius. That was about it. At that time, I what I had was mediated understandings of the Church Fathers. I listened to like Protestant professors and some Catholics, but I listened to like Protestant professors, seminary professors, giving lectures on the Church Fathers. So I had a vague idea of what the Church Fathers believed. I knew that the Church Fathers were not Baptists. Yeah. I knew that the Church Fathers. <laughs> I knew enough to know that the church fathers all believed in baptismal regeneration and the real presence. And that's why I believe that as a Presbyterian, traditional Presbyterians do believe in those things. And so I knew, I knew enough to make like a spark notes about it. But recently, like I'm, I'm glad I had that Jay Dyer discussion because even though it was sort of an embarrassment that I didn't know what I was talking about, made me realize maybe I, I have to actually read these things if I'm going to be talking about them on the internet. Wait, when so, did you talk to Jay Dyer? Well, I had this Jay Dyer discussion in October, so it wasn't supposed to be a debate. It was just a, a discussion, a casual discussion. But, you know. You got, he, you got to watch Jay. Jay's autistic, bro. He knows, like, every single thing I've ever With my parody with him, I actually, your video inspired me a little bit with that because yeah. I made a video where he talks to Gavin Ortland, and Gavin's like, I want to have a dialogue. And Jay's like, no, I, I want to do a debate. <laughs> I want to do a debate. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so he was just like, well, uh, what, what do you think about what the Cappadocian fathers said about that? And yeah, I was like, he's nuts. Oh, You're like, bro, I don't know. I don't know. I have <laughs> so afterwards, I was like, yeah, it was, it was a good discussion. But then the Orthobros started to be like, Jim Dyer destroyed. He said that that's what started the um, conflict between me and the 14-year-old Orthobros in my server, in my Discord server. <laughs> it, it's, it's nothing. It's like there are these people who say I, I – um, I'm anti-orthodox just because I got into some conflict with 14 year old ortho LARPers who don't even go to church on my server. That's what happened basically. Um, but it inspired me to, uh, read the church fathers. So lately, yes, I have been, re I've read most of the apostolic fathers. I've read a lot of Athanasius, Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas. And what I'm noticing is that like, I was expect part of me was expecting to read them and expecting them to all be Eastern Orthodox and 
Part of me was hoping that I would read them and discover that they're all Calvinists. Turns out they're just the church fathers. They, you can't really put them into any like clear category. If you could, everyone would be the same denomination. You got to let the church fathers be the church fathers. Most of what they talk about is not really that relevant to our debates today. A lot of what they talk about is just like interesting philosophical meditations. Uh, yeah, I, it was funny. I was reading Clement of Rome and everything was sounding really interesting. And then he just talks about the Phoenix, like it's a real bird. I'm like, Oh, yeah. okay, I wasn't expecting that. So <clears throat> it's, it's interesting reading the church fathers. Of course, it's not nearly as illuminating as the scriptures, but it's very interesting to see what different people talk about at different times, like what their focus is on at different times. Like in the beginning, the apostolic fathers, not as much philosophical speculation. It's mostly just about defending the truth of Christianity. And then if you read Gregory of uh, Nazianzus or Gregory of Nyssa or Augustine, then it's a lot about, and Athanasius, then it's a lot about how the Trinity works and how Christology works. I'm reading uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, The Life of Moses right now. And that's a lot on just how to live a holy life. Like right. that's what, that whole book is on but the, the, the interesting thing about the fathers is you have to really understand the context of what they're writing in they're writing at a time where paganism still exists right so so they're writing about the truths of christianity in a pagan world where it's it's very interesting so like have you read augustine city of god uh um i just started that i've read his confessions i'm starting his city of god so Confessions is, is just his conversion story, basically. But City of God is, is, is super interesting because he's talking about how the the altars, of, you know, these altars are being set up. And because these altars are being set up, the pagan gods are being banished. So you're seeing you're seeing the prophecies in Daniel fulfilled. Yeah. So in Daniel, you have these prophecies about a kingdom that's going to come. Right. And, then, right. And, and and this is what, uh, because I heard you talking to Trent. Uh, I just listened to that conversation today and you guys were discussing salvation from like a Catholic standpoint. Uh, and you asked him like, okay, so is it fair to say that a Catholic believes they're saved uh, by grace through faith and works, right? Like, the, like, because I think a lot of Catholics don't really know how to answer that question. And one thing I always kind of, I wish Trent would, explain more of is part of the catholic gospel is is the kingdom it's so much a part of it right so when so okay so so mario you're gonna you i've heard you make this comment where you like i hate the argument from catholics where they say rome big therefore true and it's a very simplistic way of of saying it right but there's something to that the Catholic Church is the church that goes and converts the world, right? It's it's going out and converting these pagan nations, getting them to turn from their idols and coming into a life, a, a Christian life. And so much of that is because Christ, through the Gospels, is saying, uh, repent and believe the good news for the kingdom is at hand. And there's there's so many Catholic apologists who leave that aspect of the Catholic gospel out of it. Like the church and the kingdom is such an intricate part of being a Catholic and salvation. I could not agree more. I strongly, strongly criticize the idea that the gospel is a theory of how salvation works. I strongly criticize the idea that the gospel is defined as salvation by faith alone. The gospel is the kingdom of God. I agree with N.T. Wright on this. Um, and so much of what I talk about with Reconquista and reclaiming the, these institutions is that the gospel is the kingdom of God that takes over and transforms the world. And that's not necessarily uh, an argument for why I believe Rome is the true church, but it definitely is an argument for why I believe Rome is a true church. Yeah. Because like Protestants who define the gospel as sola fide, they'll say, oh, Rome's not a true church. They anathematize the gospel at Trent. Uh, but because the Bible says the uh, gospel is about the kingdom of God. Well, because Rome and the East, even if they have different understanding of justification, they're spreading the kingdom of God. So, yeah. and they are spreading the kingdom of God in the name of the true King. We believe in the same Jesus. So that's, that's where my ecumenism with Rome and the East, which some more strict uh, fundamentalist Protestants, especially the Baptists don't like. I yeah, would say, too, just one more clarification about something you mentioned that I said. I actually said 
that Rome being the biggest is the best argument for Rome. I didn't say that I didn't oh, like it. Oh, I thought you were mocking it. That was the strongest argument for Rome. And I, I said it in a sort of backhanded way where I said, because it ain't history, but it might be their size. Like, you know, that might be what they got. Well, but well, I, I just I, wanted to clarify that. I don't want to start an argument I, with you, but I wanted to, you know, I actually I do think that there's some power in that argument. I think I was, like so Zoomer points out that like the Catholics and the Orthodox have a very different stance towards each other now than they would have a uh, hundred years ago before the council, even right when the Orthodox still kind of hate Rome, but Rome has kind of put this olive branch out to the East, which is very new. But I would say um, my understanding of how there's still some kind of a communion between East and West is that I see when when Jesus says uh, he is the temple, right? Like tear down this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. There's such an a, 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 an important aspect of the temple itself no longer exists because we don't offer sacrifice in the temple anymore. The temple is now Christ's body, and wherever we offer the mass and have have and we celebrate the mass, that is the temple is wherever we celebrate the mass. So the kingdom is wherever the king is, and the king is wherever the Eucharist is. And so somehow that Eucharistic kingdom extends to East and West, despite each other anathematizing each, each other and things like that. That's, that's where I would try to understand that, I guess. Have you read the Westminster Confession? No, I haven't. Yeah. It's what the Westminster, that's exactly what the Westminster Confession says. The visible church is where the sacraments are administered and the word of God is preached. Because for that, that exact reason, that's where Christ is present, where we have the sacraments. Yeah, there's, I mean, wherever the king is, there is the kingdom, right? So yeah. there's, there's, I know the East has, because when we're talking about salvation, like a Catholic will say you're saved by grace, but that's, that's like, you're dead in your sins because I did nothing to earn God's grace in my life. I was, if you guys knew what I was doing before my uh my reversion really so like so a catholic does believe that at baptism you are born again but i left the faith for years right and then by god's grace he calls me back so that initial thing is i was dead in my sins i did nothing to deserve it but god somehow shined grace into my heart to get me to come back to him and then throughout my life i'm constantly trying to emulate the life of Christ. So an, an Eastern Orthodox would say that's theosis. And, and I know you were saying the fathers, when you read, I forgot who you said you were reading. You were like, all I keep hearing is theosis over and over. Uh, me? Yeah. Yeah. The fathers definitely did believe in theosis. All, all Christian traditions have a uh, doctrine of theosis. The uh, East wasn't unique, uniquely focused on it until like the 20th century. But Athanasius definitely does talk about theosis. He says, uh, talks a lot about partaking of the divine. He talks a lot about his famous quote is man. God became man so that man might become God. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot more. I'm not saying it's the same. There's a lot more similarity on justification and predestination between uh, the reformed and the Catholics than a lot of people think. It's not identical and there still are important differences, but both sides misunderstand each other and misunderstand their own views. I, yeah, I a lot of it's probably semantic, right? A lot of it is semantic, I think. Like, there still is the, the distinction between imputed righteousness and infused righteousness. Like, that's a real distinction. But as Trent Horn told me, and I agree, a faith plus works is a very unhelpful and way yeah. oversimplified way to describe the Catholic position. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, uh, Mario, do you guys, what is your, what is the Eastern position on purgatory? Do you guys have any concept of purgatory? I'm not nearly, I'm not nearly smart enough to answer that question. Uh, oh, no, I'm not. About, I'm not asking you to to be a. Don't uh, ask them about toll houses. Don't ask them about toll houses. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but on purgation in particular, I haven't read enough, and I don't know enough to actually answer that question. And it's not something that I've heard talked about a lot. What I've heard yeah, is I'd... that um, some Eastern Orthodox believe in toll houses. Some don't. It's not like no council talks about it. So it's sort of. Oh, toll houses is different than purgation, though, because toll houses would be what happens after you die, like the concept of an angel taking you up. Um, right. That's different than purgation and how all of that works. So I don't, I, have, I haven't studied that issue enough in particular to answer that. But as far as toll houses go, yeah, I affirm toll houses. I believe in toll houses. 
Right. I heard some people say that it's like the Russian Orthodox tend to affirm it more and like the Antiochian Orthodox tend to affirm it less or something. Is that true? I, I have no idea about that, but um, a lot of people I know, because the parish that I'm attending is Antiochian Orthodox. Okay. Uh, a lot of people believe in toll houses, but it's not like something that like people are talking about. Like, uh, like I've never heard a homily on toll houses. Right. Or, I've never heard a homily on purgatory. Yeah. Like there's certain topics that I guess just don't, <laughs> don't come up at time. That that are very weird to outsiders. And I think toll houses and purgatory, toll houses for Orthodox and purgatory for Catholics are two of those things that are sort of odd when you look out from the, uh, from the outset. But yeah, I'm, I'm going I off. This is yeah. actually a very easy to defend position. I think it is. I think Trent Horn definitely won the purgatory debate recently. Oh, really? I think he won. I'm not saying I agree with him, but I, I think you think he did I better think he won than the that. debate. Yeah. Uh, I think, like, for, for a Protestant to understand purgatory, I heard, um, I think I heard Patrick Madrid explain it this way. It's like, okay, um, you believe you need to be cleansed of your sin by the blood of Jesus, right? So, yeah, after you die is when that blood of Jesus cleanses you, and that's basically purgatory. It's like, when you die, the blood of Jesus cleanses you, and it purges you of your, I mean, it's really just your attachments that you still hold on to. The, the sins that you haven't purged yourself of there's there's a way to, that you know this is a person who died in a state of grace had a life with god but there's still some attachments that have to be dealt with yeah the way i see the catholic view i know that like a lot of medieval concepts of purgatory made it seem like active punishment seems to me like the modern catholic view is that it's just post-death sanctification it's like extra sanctification after death like protestants would agree that this life is purgatory basically yeah. this life where we are being purged of our sin and that is often a painful experience so this life is purgatory uh the question is when you die does your sinful flesh die with you or not that's the question yeah. and i think you can make an equally convincing case for both sides because it's like your soul lives on your soul is still corrupted it's not just your physical <laughs> body that's corrupted um I'm going off script here. This is not what the reform tradition necessarily says. I think what happens between death and the final judgment is kind of a mystery. So I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I don't know if there's actually any church doctrine defining exactly what happens either. Rob, do you, do you, do you know what we have to believe the fide? Like there's, there's some things that like a Catholic is obliged to submit to. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure what we have to submit to in that. Well, so we have to, at the moment of death, you'll have your particular judgment, which will determine your eternal place. That's if you're right? going up or down. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, and then from there, you will either go to hell, purgatory, or heaven. If you go to purgatory, you'll eventually get to heaven. Um, and then, really, then it's just at the end of time, there will be the general judgment, um, you know, of all of humanity. Um, and that's really, really about it. See, but we were we were we were talking about this a while ago, and it's it's uh, if you think about okay, you die, don't you don't you leave space and time? No one knows. I think it's so a mystery. You, right, there's a mystery there, right? So it, it's almost like if you leave space and time, couldn't it be that when you die, you just are at the resurrection, and well, everyone that's, that's there is there present? That's called soul sleep. Uh, some people have held to soul sleep, which is basically you die in the next moment you open your eyes. It's the final judgment. Generally, most denominations, I think, reject this because there are verses about, like Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. And Paul, Paul too. Paul about, says, I'm eager, I'm eager to yeah. be with Christ, things like that. Yeah. I think yeah. Catholics have to d deny that. Too. Like, that's not, you, you're not allowed to believe that as a Catholic. <laughs> yeah. The, the Westman, it's not like heresy or anything to believe in soul sleep. It's just it's more of just speculation and it goes against most of the Bible and tradition. I wouldn't have a, if someone said, I believe in soul sleep, I wouldn't be offended or anything. Yeah. I, just, I just don't think there's much good reason to believe in it. Yeah. Uh, could I read a quote about toll houses and see yeah, if you guys yeah. guess who said it? Yeah, sure. All okay. right. At the moment of death, the spirit departs from the body and moves through the atmosphere. But the scripture teaches us that the devil lurks there. He is the prince of power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. 2. If the eyes of our understanding were opened, one would probably see the air filled with demons, the enemies of Christ. If Satan could hinder the angel of Daniel for three weeks on his mission to earth, we can imagine the opposition a Christian may encounter at death. The moment of death is Satan's final opportunity to attack the true believer. But God has sent his angels to guard us at that time. 
Who is articulating the doctrine of soul houses there? Can I guess? Uh, Martin, 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 Luther. Luther. Martin Luther. No. Don Thomas Aquinas. Um, that was Billy Graham. Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah, I just think it's funny that Billy Graham had that quote. Like well, Billy Graham. The, the, reason said, said, uh, the reason I said Dante is because Dante. I mean, if you read the Inferno, which I, it's very difficult to read, but I've heard people like give, like expound on it, and it. I mean, you're talking about like uh, him going into the like he has to go down into the depths before he could go up, and that's kind of like the orthodox view, I believe, right? It's something like... I have, have I've to... never actually read Dante, um, but I had I've, my buddy Cole read it when we went on a North Carolina trip, and he was spurging out about it, talking about it constantly. Like, it was the best thing he's ever read. So I still got to read it. Yeah. yeah. And that, that doesn't make sense. Like, the Book of Enoch, which, unless you're Ethiopian Orthodox, is not canon, the Book of Enoch does speak of the uh, Archangel Michael and the devil fighting over the body of Moses after he died. So this idea that angels and demons fight over people's souls right after they die, number one, it's in the Book of Enoch. Number two, a lot of near-death experiences sort of support that because um, Jordan Cooper has this good video where he analyzes near-death experiences. He quotes this book written by an Eastern Orthodox guy. So it's like, I think my... My understanding of what I think happens right after death is maybe similar to Eastern Orthodoxy, even though I think it's a mystery, but I think that's a possibility. Gordon Cooper, please unblock me on Twitter if you see this. Please unblock me on Twitter. <laughs> I don't know what I did. I don't know what I did to deserve it. I'm sure I deserved it, but please unblock me. <laughs> what uh, What would either of you say is like the weird – because as a Catholic, like the weirder the thing, the more I love it. You know, okay, so cool. is well, like what's something... the weirdest thing look at to look to look at and see in Catholicism from the outside? Yeah, like and what do you look at? And, and I have one. Gonna... I have one. I, can I go Let's first? Hear it. <laughs> uh, for me, and I know that this because it's so central to so many people's faith. I do not understand like the obsession with certain Marian private revelations that people have. That from the outside, I get. I I don't even get it. So like, Marian uh, apparitions is a weird like one, the magic right? girly stuff and Fatima well, and all. Well, a lot like, of us don't even get magic girly. Straight so. up don't understand, and I'll hear stories and I'll be like, "That sounds crazy," and I'll just be like, "Yeah, I'm gonna focus on me and doing what I'm doing over here." And, so okay, that so, that for me is just the weirdest thing for sure. So and as, everything as, else a, is as a Catholic, you do not have to believe any private revelation oh, yeah, no. is true, right? So it, you don't. No. It's is private revelation. The ones that the church will say are acceptable to follow are ones that do not contradict anything in scripture. They don't contradict anything in doctrine. The one that you'll always find pretty much most Catholics are like, well, this one's a little different is Fatima, right? Because Fatima yeah. is witnessed by 70,000 people where the sun dislodges in the sky and there's miracles that go along with it. So Fatima, I would say is a little bit different than just your everyday private revelation. But I also do think the Catholics that go too deep into private revolution revelation are you're dipping into some scary waters there, you, man. You don't want to make private devotions or apparitions more than devotions, but you don't want to well, make them your faith. Is the weirdest one to me. I don't. I don't think that your church has co-signed it, though. So I'm not accusing. No, Medjugorje. Yeah. Medjugorje is a strange one. But, it's also it's weird because Medjugorje is a very, I guess, it kind of plays a very uh, significant role in my life because my parents went there in the 90s. My dad went there an atheist and came back a practicing Catholic. My mom stopped using yeah. birth control. My mom stopped using birth control and had five more kids. So I have five siblings that only exist because my parents went to Medjugorje and I think Medjugorje is wacky. Like, yeah, I'm well, like, I'm not a naturalist. I'm not, I'm not like approaching these things like, oh, it's impossible. It can't happen. There can't be an apparition. I just feel like Medjugorje, like what I've heard about Medjugorje, I find disturbing. What I've heard about other ones, uh, I don't have as strong of an opinion on, but it's still just odd to me from the yeah. outside. It's just odd. Um, Wait, do they but not all, not all Catholic miracles by any stretch, but just those. Okay, so do they have Eucharistic miracles in the East? Yeah, yeah. Well, but like, Eucharistic miracles in the East are generally like not a good thing it, from an Eastern Orthodox oh. perspective. So if you have like, take for example, um, the Eucharist turns into like actual flesh or something. That's a bad sign. That means that the priest didn't have faith or that it, the congregation. It means that same in, way here for in us. the West too. 
Oh, okay. I didn't know that, but I was yeah. just going to say Zoomer, that. Zoomer, have you ever looked into Eucharistic positively from what I've seen? And I'm, I can't teach on this. I'm not, you know, I'm not some authority, but based on what I know, not a Zoomer, have you ever seen Eucharistic miracles? Yeah, I've looked into them. Uh, there's some Eastern Eucharistic miracles, some Coptic Eucharistic miracles, some Anglican ones. Yeah. Uh, there's There aren't Presbyterian Eucharistic miracles. I mean, I know myself and many other Presbyterians I know have powerful experiences of the Eucharist. That's not the same as a Eucharistic No, no, miracle. no. We're talking something supernatural yeah. happens. Like, yeah, like we will have bleeding hosts. Okay? Yeah, that so... Human heart well, tissue. My, my uh, approach to all these things, whether it's Eucharistic miracles or Fatima or Marian apparitions or anything like that. My approach is just open-mindedness, but also caution. I think all yeah. of them could be true. I don't dogmatically assert any of them because if it is God working, I don't want to say it's not. If it's not God working, I don't want to dogmatically say it is. And if the Catholic church doesn't require me to believe in it yeah. and I'm not even Catholic, yeah. then I, I don't see why I need to dogmatically affirm it. I think the weirdest thing in the Catholic church is now, I'm not even saying it's like bad. I just, thing i find is weird especially because my mom is a she's now a devout roman catholic oh, the relics the things with the relics like oh, those are my the mom best. was telling me like oh yeah today no, I saw that's awesome come on zoomer no Wait a minute. Minute. your <laughs> mom is a devout roman catholic oh yeah she's based but I um did, i just have to tell you something that means she's yeah. praying the rosary for you and that means you're going to be catholic too <laughs> rosary for the reconquista <laughs> Yo, your whole you're bringing your whole squad into Rome, bro. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> that tweet, that tweet you did. I think it was either yesterday or the day before. Maybe it was today. I don't remember. Where you said if I met Pope Francis, he'd tell me to stay Presbyterian, do the Reconquista. That I that was your. That's probably the funniest tweet I've ever seen. I think I, he would. I, I, sent, I sent that tweet to Anthony. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I think it's, talk to him about I think that. we all know that that is true. I think we I all think know that. So, 100%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but my, so my, my mom would tell me, like, oh, I got back from church and uh, there was this saint's heart, it, like, preserved. Oh, man, at, that is so cool. And I, that I'm is like, so cool. I'm not, I know I'm, it's not weird. Saying, I'm not saying it's like bad or gross or anything. I'm just like, we do not do that at First Presbyterian Church, <laughs> dude. You gotta so, get into the spooky elements, bro. The skulls. Yes, yeah, there's something. There's something like uh, dark and and uh, mysterious about, especially early Catholicism, right? So if you're going back into the early church, especially if you um, if you're understanding what's going on as Christianity's spreading, you have these. Uh, I think it, I think Joshua Charles was on with us. We were talking about um, some of the early saints talking about the Oracle of Delphi could no longer make predictions because there were certain saints had died and their bones were close by. And something happened where there would be miracles performed when we would venerate the relics of saints. And this is this is a very, very early church practice. Um, it's that's what actually starts us uh, raising people to the altars, we call it, and the canonization process. When so uh, the modern canonization process is uh, it's a little different than it used to be, but there like two miracles are required before a person can be elevated to you know through the canonization process. But in the early church, if a if a if a person was martyred or if they were um just lived an extraordinarily holy life when they died god would allow their relics to give miraculous healings and things like that and it just developed into this cult of you know people get scared by that word cult but cult is just the way you worship right so it's uh like creed code cult it's it's your creed is what you believe your code is the way you live and your cult is how you worship so just these strange practices would pop up from the early church and it's just developed over time and now we have like first and second and third class relics and so my we had a reliquary come by our house uh, about uh two years ago my cousin's wife had um she, after she had a baby there was uh, what you call a window. So she had a C-section and there was a window that her skin was so thin that the doctors told her, her if she her gets pregnant wall. again, she could die. Not that uh, skin. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, it was like so thin, they call it a window. So the 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 reliquary comes by and my, my cousin's wife touched a relic of St. Maximilian Colby, felt a burning sensation in her stomach. The next time she went back to the doctor, the doctor was like, you're totally fine. You can have a kid. They named their kid Colby because they touched the, the relic of St. Maximilian Colby. 
Well, I, and I, I believe that. I believe that yeah. that's something that happened. So uh, someone was asking how my mom became Catholic. Long story. So she's one of those people who was like, you know, a, a cradle Catholic who walked away because it was just cultural Catholicism and nobody cared. And she was sort of a, my parents were both hippies when I was born, new yeah. age hippies. Uh, and, and briefly, uh, my family, I was not a believer at this time, but my family briefly went to this PCA Presbyterian church where my dad converted. You know what the PCA is like? It's, it's Baptist with a, I, I, I promised Jonathan McKenzie I wouldn't say that. The PC is a very evangelical style a lot of the time. And they had contemporary worship music. And my mom remembered the the based Catholic worship music from her childhood. And she was listening to this like jazz Christian stuff. And my, what, my what, dad played the band at, at church. Yeah. And stuff. <laughs> what, what really got her set over the edge was we were driving in a car and I just heard jazz on the radio. And I was like, this sounds like church music. <laughs> and then my mom was like, screw this. I'm going back to the Catholic church. So that is there is so crazy. the amazing power of contemporary worship music is that it made my new age hippie liberal mom go to the Roman Catholic church. <laughs> That's how powerful contemporary music is. Okay, so have you ever attended a Catholic mass? Many times. Oh, okay. Now, was it a Novus Ordo? Have you been to a traditional Latin mass? No, I've been to Novus Ordo. I, my girlfriend and I often uh, go to mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral when she visits New York City. So I've been to, I've been to my mom's church many times. Her church is great, her parish um will you, oh man i would i would love to take you to a traditional mass next time you're in new york like are you're in texas now you said right yeah but i am back in new york in the summer and so stuff if you come back i'm I, we'll exchange info if you're ever interested in coming i'll bring you to a traditional mass i'll meet you near you you know i won't make you go right. all the way out far but there's especially in manhattan there's one um at holy innocence where it's it's just something that you should witness because it's it's extre it's it's almost like time travel where you're just thrown into this ritual that was practiced from the Middle Ages and it was before the Reformation, before all of it, and it really is something that it, it you'll just look at it and just just for the historical value, you know, just to see <clears throat> this this ritual has been practiced for centuries in the Christian Church. Yeah, I think everyone needs to revive their traditions. I want. Methodists to go back to traditional Methodist worship. I want Baptists to go back to traditional Baptist worship with uh, the with the gospel choir and the hymns, not this hill song. I want the um, yeah like the PCUSA is much better at keeping the traditional Presbyterian style than like the PCA, which has like a lot more non denominational style. And so I support the Latin Mass for Catholics. I support. I mean, there really isn't uh, an Eastern Orthodox Novus Ordo or Eastern Orthodox uh, CCM. But I guess I support them to keep on doing what they're doing because tradition. By the authority, by the authority yeah. of the most holy Neo Thomas Manualist, I call upon Christian Byzantine Mario and Redeem Sewer to shave their beards and accept the 24 Thomistic Theses of St. Pius X. So um, you are getting married uh, in, a, in a year or so. You, you had mentioned on Trent's show. Um, is, what's your girlfriend think of all this stuff you got going on? Um. I mean, she, she's a big fan. Um, she'll be my fiance soon. Uh, her name is the future Mrs. Zoomer on Instagram and stuff. <laughs> Does she and watch her stuff? Does she watch her stuff? She watches the main things. Uh, she doesn't, she doesn't use social media much. I think she got frozen in a glacier in the 1600s and <laughs> because she just hates the internet, even though she met me on the internet, she just does not like being on social media a lot of the time. And she won't listen to anything that was written after 1900. And she's she's in the PCA. Uh, her church is contemporary, but she doesn't like it. She's not reconquisting with you, bro? Well, sort of. <laughs> she, she has a job at a local PCUSA church, but her membership is at a PCA. Well, I'm not trying to flash you. I just would have thought that she would be a reconquista gang. Sort of. She, she will be when you get married, I assume. Yeah, when we get married, we're just going to find the best Presbyterian church we can find, wherever it is, and probably it'll be PCUSA. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But well, it, listen, I think, yeah. I think. So I watched your conversation with Calvin Robinson. Yeah, and that was an interesting one because Calvin's an interesting guy. Like I've talked to Calvin. Calvin's been on my show. Um, yeah. He's an interesting guy because he's like he talks like a Catholic and everything, but he's like, yeah, but I don't like because it's it's a very strange time to be Catholic, 
right? So you you had said today, you're like, yeah, I, I admit that Rome is a million times more stable than my whatever. And I'm like, I've never heard anybody describe Rome as stable right now because most Catholics are losing their mind. Compared to me, like, do you guys have les do you guys have lesbian atheist pastors? No, we don't. Okay, then, no, then just you Eucharistic ministers. Then you guys are doing better than we're doing. Um <laughs> there's the New York in them coming out. I like it. <laughs> you guys are doing better. Um it's like the uh even like Pope Francis with or I I I think the most liberal it gets is James Martin, I guess, and he yeah. is way less liberal than a lot of people in the Presbyterian church these days. And yeah, I know he that still has to paint within lines. Like he right. still can't come right out and say homosexuality is totally fine. Like he can't do that. He, he there, still has I mean, to paint yeah. within a line. There are Catholic heretics like Richard Rohr, but they don't have like power in the church. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah cool. I, uh, I, I kind of like Pope Francis, honestly, especially because he said Martin Luther was right about justification and freaked everyone out. <laughs> you know what he did that I liked? You know, he did one thing I liked, too. He venerates St. Seraphim of Sarab. St. Seraphim of Sarab, pray for us. And that's pretty based. But I will I will say that uh, I don't like what he's doing to my TLM buddies, and I don't like that's, what he's doing with the, with the weird sophistry with the gay stuff. I don't like that. Well, okay, yeah. so I think uh... – He's not. He's not pro gay. He called into. A, he's calling for an investigation of this ugly gender ideology. No, he's not. Yeah. I'm not saying. I'm not saying he's all the way. All the way yeah. there. He's not. He's, 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 not, he's, he's not, trying to be political and keep everybody happy. That's what I think he's doing. I yeah. think he. I think he's watering down certain more important things in order to have outreach with people, and it's tricky for the more traditional types, especially when he's you know hammering down on our liturgy and I, it's just. I, I've, <laughs> but to hear you say that we're we're a million times more stable was just like refreshing. I'm like, really? Wow! Because <laughs> most Catholics think the freaking the empire is collapsing right now. We're like, what is going on, man? You, you but, guys, you guys should be grateful. You have like what I long for. What Reconquista is trying to achieve is a strong institutional church that's both traditional and conservative theologically and morally you guys have that with the roman catholic church like in terms of just what it looks like institutionally the catholic church is everything i'm i kind of wish the protestant churches were again because they used to be like that the protestant churches used to be just like structured the same as the catholic churches where you had like you know we have the church of england or the church of scotland you have these big institutional churches that are strict on doctrine and they are doctrinally conservative but they're all very institutional very traditional have tons of beautiful churches and all that and it's a very modern thing that <laughs> protestants don't have that anymore thursday i'll be well, Zoomer, i'll have time. you know you can believe in evolution and still be catholic i know you I like know. that i do I like, like it that's why the i think the most science-friendly denominations are presbyterian and catholic Especially Catholic. You want to know what's ironic? I I grew up my whole life being uh being okay with evolution, and then in the past year, I'm like, nope, I'm not buying it no more. <laughs> like, just, no just way. Respond to the respond to the comments. I don't wish Protestantism was Catholicism. I wish Protestantism was what Protestantism used to be 60 years ago, which meant yeah. it had the things pr Catholicism currently has. It's a you very to... yeah very modern thing for Protestant churches to look ugly. Oh well, let's talk. Let's talk about that because that's an interesting thing. Because your your start, you recognize there's something to a beautiful church, right? Yeah. So, but you have to understand what we were talking about before with the kingdom. The reason Catholics were building those beautiful churches, it's the were kingdom. They were right. You, they're building the kingdom. They're building castles for the king. That's and what we you, think. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. You're building a castle for the king. So while you're in church in this beautiful cathedral, you should be meditating on the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, and that heaven heaven is colonizing earth through the church. Yes, so the church's man. architecture and music needs to reflect that. That's why that's why the church music needs to sound sort of baroque and needs to sound like uh, royal coronation anthems. It's like you would not 
even today, when a king marches down like a, an aisle or something, you wouldn't play like casual. Zoomer, we need you on our team, bro. Stop with this fantasy and restoring mainline <laughs> Protestantism. I want you on our side. We need a we need it's a like, guy like you. Yeah, here's because the thing, Zoomer. I think a- honestly, Zoomer, I think that your project ends up in one of two places: Orthodoxy or Rome. And I oh, think in your cool. Discord, I think in your Discord, you've seen that happen. I. What is it? What is it that I mean? You like you like Rome better because it's science. You, you like science. What's what? What are you dragging your feet on? Is it just the Mary stuff? No, it's it's because I well I think that Protestantism has the best potential of all the branches of Christianity. Because remember, up until Protestantism got hijacked, like sixty, a hundred years ago, Protestantism was kind of like Catholicism, except a lot more successful. I think there's a reason why the historically Protestant countries like America, Britain, Scandinavia are so successful. Like Protestantism it, caused really that, high literacy. Is that, not a, ma- uh, is that not a materialist view though? Well, I think, well, it's the kingdom of God transforms the world. And I think no form of Christianity transformed the world as much as Protestantism did. I think there, I, there's a reason America is so successful. It's because of the Puritans. Uh, so I think Protestantism has more potential the Protestant work else. ethic. What? They said the Protestant work ethic. Well, there's a Protestant work ethic. There's also high literacy rates. Um, so there's a lot of potential that Protestantism has. There's also a lot of dangers that it has. The danger of Protestantism has is the danger to keep splitting. Um, but yeah. I think the, the potential is that I think Protestantism built the most successful societies. Now, that's the cultural reason I'm Protestant. The theological reason is I think its doctrines are true, and it's as simple as that. But I think yeah, you were asking and you, more, and you're going to stay there until you come to a different conclusion. Right. But I think you were asking more. It's like if I think the Catholic Church is so much culturally stronger than the Protestant Church, which it is today. Why am I not Catholic? It's because I think the Protestant churches have the potential to be very strong, but they've been hijacked. Now you could say, why if Protestantism got hijacked, doesn't it show that the gates of hell prevailed against it? Well, there's, there's been no theologically liberal hijack of Islam or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnessesism. I think that the enemy has hijacked Protestantism because it's a threat to Satan's kingdom. And I don't have to speculate that because the Frankfurt School, the cultural Marxists, the, these Jewish guys like uh, the Herbert Marcuse or other people like Antonio Gramsci, they specifically said, the institutional church is the greatest threat to our movement. So we need to hijack the institutional church and they hijacked the institute in the institutional church. They saw the institutional Protestant churches as a threat to their movement. So that, okay. I, I gr- granted that, but it's not like Jews, like any of us, the Bolshevik revolution happened with Jews. <laughs> I, sorry. I don't know if this is, is this too politically incorrect? <laughs> uh, just it's, say homage. It's fine. Uh, with with it's the potential. Fine. Okay, okay. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shield my language. Particular communities aren't particularly fond of Christians, right? And I don't think Protestantism is unique in having a particular community be vitriolic towards them because no, I think that particular no, community it's, it's is not, it's not unique at all. I think they would have hijacked the Catholic Church if they could. I think the strength of Catholicism is that it's. A more and more to being hijacked, more difficult uh, to hijack, but it's been hijacked, man. There's definitely yeah, listen, there's yeah, it's been hijacked, and and like where much. you see stability, you're looking in from the outside, where a lot of us who were in it are saying, Man, can't we just get a priest to preach on something a little look? We're dealing with the same stuff, it's just the institution is 2,000 years old, and yeah. you know, it's I, I mean, I believe it's because God made it so that it would be very difficult to overthrow so yeah like the, the biggest threat to catholicism is not outsiders infiltrating the biggest threat to catholicism is its own members apostatizing i by the way i gave him permission that's who i, <laughs> I gave him a free pass um yeah yeah it was a free pass and we love them we love everybody we want everyone to be christians you know it's yeah, all love yeah. yes <laughs> i uh, yeah, I, th- I think but the, that, but the religious beefs go way back. We all yeah. know it. I have to give credit where credit is due. And the Catholic Church has been more successful than Protestantism at resisting progressivism. That is unquestionable. It's also been more stable. I would say that a lot of um, Catholics and Orthodox benefit from Protestantism without knowing it. It's like if you've ever done a Bible study, that was invented by Lutheran pietists. The idea that laymen would study theology, that was originally like a, a Protestant thing. I think that the Catholic Church has improved in many ways by 
in some ways listening and adopting some of the ideas of the reformation i think the council that's more, that's more printing press than you guys man it's not like nah, i think i think he's got a point i'll i'll give him that like uh, i i'll say i have a way better understanding of scripture because i wanted to be able to answer the protestant accusing me of not reading scripture right so and and i think the church uh, and especially lay Catholic apologists have done a way better job of preparing us to handle some of those conversations. <laughs> Who do you laugh yeah. at? I think, the Byzantine uh, scoundrel since Fatima <laughs> real, why not laugh? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, conversations between Catholics and Protestants help each other because it helps, it causes Protestants to need to read the church fathers. It causes Catholics to need to memorize those scripture proof texts. Dude, I think you're an anomaly, man. I'm, I mean, I can only go based on my my typical interaction right but the typical interaction i have with a protestant is catholicism is from the devil and it's pagan and they're not actually thinking you know like they like i think you would even recognize that even some of the weirder catholic things that we do are based in scripture they're just based on scripture through typology and they're a lot harder to see they're not just some surface level proof text that i could give you but you know our understanding of our lady and mary is because we see mary as the bearer of the new covenant she's the ark of the new covenant well zwingli so, said that as well zwingli said mary's the new ark yeah i mean she is she i mean what was in the original ark it was the manna it was the ten commandments and and aaron's uh staff so you have the bread it was from the word heaven, of God. The word, word of God, God was in the ark. The word of God was in Mary. It's simple. That's it. It's very simple, you know. Yeah, so but something I was going to say is that it's not so much that it that Zoomer's an anomaly because I know a lot of guys like him coming from the Reformed world. Um, but it, what it is is that it is an anomaly when you think Protestant, you think evangelical because yeah. they've won. They've yeah. won Protestantism. The main line yeah. uh, is we're gonna we're gonna let Zoomer do his thing there, but what I was gonna say is just that um, a lot of the reform guys are very well read and will read patristics, and um, they're definitely <laughs> they're definitely the hardest guys to spar with theologically when it comes to the Protestant world. So, whoa! Yeah, and, look at look at this look at this humble brag from Thursday here because he got somebody named Blessed Thursday saying he's the real Thursday, but I did see video of Matt Brad walking through a conference and college girls flipping out, screaming like a boy band when Thursday walked well, To be fair, so. though, with the money he's throwing around, are we sure he just didn't pay them, too? <laughs> you gotta hide your girl around Thursday, Thursday man. Stop, stop throwing money at us, man. I, yeah. I do appreciate it so much, but stop giving us money, dude. I, like, a lot of, there's, I want to go back to something you said. You said, like, a lot of people might be converting to Catholicism and Orthodoxy because I tell people to care about tradition so much, and I think there might be a few cases of that, but I think that generally people are waking up to the importance of tradition and beauty and institutions, and there, because of evangelicalism, there's this idea that that's a Catholic thing. That's an Orthodox thing. I'm trying to say, no, that's a Christian thing. I'm trying to say Protestants do have those things. We simply need to reclaim them. The mainline churches are Narnia, created good, created by base Christians, hijacked by the evil witch, hijacked by, as, as St. John Knox said, the monstrous regiment of women. So we need to retake it. We need to retake it or else there will always be this illusion that... Um, beauty and institutions it's some sort of roman catholic or east orthodox thing rather than simply a universal christian thing how many sacraments do you have in uh two, two. so it's just baptism and the eucharist yeah we to for something to be a sacrament we the reformers said it had to be necessary for salvation and instituted by jesus so you were asking about marriage i think right is that what you were asking about and was that you? I, somebody was asking about marriage. Is is I, there anywhere that scripture states that marriage is a sacrament or something? Or yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if I asked that. I we see marriage as more of a covenant than a sacrament. Well, okay, but the word covenant, me like translate the word covenant into Latin, and it's sacramentum, right? So that's actually what sacrament means. It means covenant. So there's uh, the what you're doing in a sacrament you're swearing a covenant in a way it's a weird thing because a covenant goes back to the seven day creation where God sevens himself on the seventh day. And that's where the word 
sacrament comes in, you seven oneself. So it's almost providential that there are seven sacraments because the word sacrament actually means to seven yourself. That's that's an interesting argument. I've not heard that before. I always thought people chose the number seven because it's a cool number. But yeah, no, it goes back to God on the seventh day of creation, making that first covenant. And then, you know, like the feast of weeks was the feast of sevens. It would be seven sevens. So the, the word seven is very important in the Old Testament. And the idea of the sacraments, it's almost like to not have seven sacraments almost mi misplaces the word. Interesting. I will look more into that. That's interesting. Um. Man, where should we go with this, uh, Mario? Well, on, you gotta. I have was going to wonder. All right, I, I have a question for Zoomer. I have a question for Zoomer. Oh, yeah, Rob, Rob, Rob hasn't spoken. I was just going to say, um, how, either in the PCA or just just within yourself, how do you look upon divorce in general? Bad. Don't do it. Um, the uh, I, I am getting married in the PCA actually, even though I'm not going to be. I am not PCA myself. Um, I'm getting married in the PCA because I want a church that cares about marriage to marry me and my girlfriend. But uh, the reform teaching on divorce is, I think, basically the same as the traditional Catholic teaching on, the, on divorce. Generally, more or less, we have the same social teachings. So divorce is bad. Jesus said divorce is bad. Don't divorce. Yeah. Unless well, there's I, a adultery. But I would, I would say the, the best way to understand it as a Catholic is... Once the priest consecrates that host and it becomes Jesus, there's no way to unconsecrate it. So that's why a Catholic's understanding is ma of marriage as a sacrament comes into play there. Just as that host can never become bread again, that marriage can never be undone. Like what God has put together, let no man tear asunder. It's impossible. Like it's actually impossible. Like you can, divorce is a myth. You can civilly divorce and break your contract, but if you marry anyone else, you're in adultery. Like there's no way around that. What about the case of some like adultery? If your wife commits adultery on you, does that break it? That doesn't even break even as a Catholic. That does not. That does not. There's, I think there's something called the Pauline provision where uh, something about your wife leaving the faith or something. I'm not even 100 percent on that. Like if your wife leaves the faith, it's more severe than if she sleeps with somebody else. Really? According to. I think what's well, according to Protestant teaching, I think just what the Bible says is that there you can Except divorce for based infidelity on, based on infidelity. But if your wife or husband leaves the faith, that's not grounds for divorce. I forget what the Pauline provision is. Somebody would have to look that. Rob, can you look that up? The Pauline provision in marriage. So, the, well, the thing is, I as a Catholic, you're especially if your spouse is looking to reconcile. Like there's there's no way that you could say that so, um the Pauline adultery. provision allows the dissolution of a marriage of two people who were not baptized at the marriage occurred okay so that's what it is it's a, it's a, it's if you convert after you're already married and the wife doesn't convert and the fact that you came into the church and they didn't is causing so much friction you, it's a ground for nullity it, it's it, as if the marriage well, never existed. no it, it's not it's not a nullment it's a dissolution of a natural marriage, not a sacramental marriage. Okay. So a sacramental marriage can never be dissolved. A natural marriage between two non-Christians can be. Right. Uh, Christian Mario, what were you going to say? Oh, no. I was just going to press you on uh, on a uh, veneration of saints. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, why, why do you not pray to saints? Do you have a theological reason or... Is it because what it leads to in your mind is too far? Or why do you not... Why do you not Pray to the Blessed Mother, to the saints. Right. Well, I've been tempted to pray to St. Athanasius many times due to mm. uh, struggles in the Reconquista. He was dealing with the exact same thing we're dealing with. Uh, so aside from that, it's just the regulative principle of worship is that if there is a, like a, a, a species of worship activity that there isn't precedent, precedent for in Scripture— it's safer to just not do it. We don't see it in the apostolic fathers debatable. Debatably, there's some uh, pre-Nicene prayer to the saints. Uh, it seems to me like it's a practice that developed over time. I'm not saying it's necessarily bad. It's just uh, the regulative principle is that God knows how he is to be worshipped. Scripture is sufficient for how we are to worship God. So there needs to be precedent for something in order to do it. Now, there's different interpretations. 
the regulative principle. A lot of people would employ it to say no instruments in worship. I would say, actually, no. Psalm 150 has a lot of instruments in worship, so we should have instruments in worship. And the uh, making beautiful churches. Every time God commands people to make a worship space, it is always a very, very beautiful worship space because it's like Eden. It's like Eden recreated. That's what our churches and our sanctuaries are like. They're copies of heaven, as Hebrews says it. So I don't need to appeal to some extra biblical tradition to argue for beauty and instruments and music and worship. Uh, but there is just no nothing of the sort of praying to the those who have fallen asleep in scripture. So out of uh, it's abundance of caution. It's not like there's a, a good reason why we don't. It's just we don't have a reason to. to what to I would kind of, say. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, to kind of push back on the. You said that there's no pre-Nicene tradition of praying. No, the there, there's one that's debatable. There's a couple that's debatable. Like like the subtuum presidium is a yeah. The, is I, a, I talked about it with Trent. He said he he admits it's debatable when it's it's dated. But I'll, yeah. I'm willing to grant it. Let's say it's let's say it's early. So I I would say uh, you you would say that uh, as Christians we're the family of God, right? Yeah. Right. Like like that. that that's we're the children of God, right? So. Um, scripture aside and all that uh the way i came to understand that was god wants you to know your siblings right the ones who came before you especially so he would grant little favors it's not like the saint is doing something for you it's that god wants you to love your older siblings so when you ask for their intercession god grants you a little favor because he wants you to love your older siblings because they're your family and that's just that's kind of how I always understood it, you know. Yeah, well, we, we should. We I should. would just say I would just say the scripture is clear that um, the saints are alive, the angels are alive, and the scripture is also clear that the angels and the saints have an awareness of what happens on earth in scripture. And then finally, um, we know that the angels and saints pray for us from scripture, so we know that they're alive. We know that they know what's going on down here, and then we also know that they pray for us. It just sort of seems like an out pouring like a logical position would be to ask for their intercession when we know that Christ being the one mediator that's him mediating between uh his humanity and his divinity and in a salvific way for us it's not it's not so much that he's the only person that intercedes because when we pray for each other that's interceding for each other so in a derivative sense we intercede for each other right um, we, I, we do believe that we should venerate the saints and venerating just the literal sense of honoring the saints and emulating the saints. And everyone has a canon of saints, even if they don't admit it. The, uh, the Baptist canon of saints might be like John MacArthur and Charles yeah. Spurgeon and <laughs> whoever else. Everyone does have a canon of saints. Like I'd say John Wesley is a, a great example of a Protestant saint. Um, John, there, I, in my school, my, my school has a Methodist seminary. There's icons of John Wesley. Uh, so the saints are alive. And according to John Calvin, we, the way we commune with the saints, the communion of the saints is Holy Communion, it's the Eucharist, because the, in some uh, interpretations of the Reformed view, we are actually caught up in heaven with the saints when we take Holy Communion. We're all sort of seated at the Lord's table together, like a recreation of the Lord's Supper, of the, of the Last Supper. And sort of that's how we commune with the saints. There's an understanding that there's like a chasm between the church militant and the church triumphant, even though we know they're alive. They use that there's, language? There's, I, that, that's the language I'm using. That's not language. That's, that's very Catholic sounding language. Even, even the idea of... Um, so, like, okay, so would your tradition understand the book of Revelation, the apocalypse? Would that just be like a prophecy about the end of the world? No, or, no, that, or that's you guys sensationalism. Under Revelation talks about the worship in heaven. Right, and we, which for us, uh, as you're reading it, you're actually reading about what we do in our liturgy, right? You have, like, these candles and an altar, and you're having the angels and saints uh, around, the, around the altar, and... So when, when a Catholic reads the apocalypse, we're reading about the worship because every mass is a miniature end of the world, essentially, you know? So I didn't know if your tradition understood it in that way also. I mean, Revelation was the one book that John Calvin was too scared to write a commentary on. But generally, we would accept that Revelation is talking about that. And I think that is why, like, I think 
I, I make a biblical argument for stained glass from Revelation because it says the holy city is filled with gems. <laughs> we don't need to actually adorn our churches with gems, but stained glass looks like gems. It, there's something uniquely beautiful about colorful, transparent light coming in. Yeah. And that's why I care about the color of the stained glass more than what it's even depicting. I think just, even if it's just abstract shapes, I think that is objectively beautiful. It looks like the gems of the heavenly Jerusalem and revelation. I think revelation is a, is supposed to be a, a guide for what worship style is, is to be like. Yeah. That's so, so interesting. Would, that you're would saying you ever a person can uh, say that the saints in heaven do pray for us? Like, would you believe that they do pray for us in heaven? Yes, but they're not omniscient. So it's like, think about how many prayers some of those uh, top tier saints must get every day. Well, um, it wouldn't be an issue of them being omniscient. God's omniscient. The Holy spirit is omniscient. And they don't need to be omniscient to have an awareness of what's going on on earth. I think, like I said, I think it's a mystery sort of what happens between, <laughs> uh, I, like I said, it's, I'm, not I'm, laughing at you. I'm laughing at the comment. I apologize. No, it's okay. It's a mystery what happens after death for us. So can the saints pray for us? What's it like when they understand us? I don't know. It's like, if we have this understanding, most people generally understand the saints are free from any sort of like pain or despair. So if we burden them with our concerns, is that causing them any pain or despair? That's something I've thought through. I know that's not very theologically, you know, not very doctrinally airtight. That's just something I've wondered. It's like Mary gave birth to God. She's done enough. She doesn't need to be bothered with my problems. That's something I've thought. Oh about. man. I would think that, um, I would think that, so, well, I would think Mary's uh, different from the other saints in some aspects, um, just because she's more, more, she's like, we would see Mary as the crown of creation, but even the other saints, I would say it's not about their omniscience. It's, it's that I really think it's that God is granting the favor through them because he wants you to love them. And, and especially um, Mary, like God wants you to love her because she's, uh, there's something about um like if you really understand how the queen works in the Davidic kingdom where it's the queen yeah. mother and the queen mother goes before the king and like begs him for little things and you're you're seeing this typological um pr like prophecy about how the Davidic kingdom will work once Christ ascends to that throne so i mean as i mean you know in revelation 6 too we see we see saints praying for us in heaven um, the martyrs in heaven directing their prayers to God, interceding for us on earth. Um, I feel like, I don't, I don't know how much of a mystery it is that the saints pray for us. I think it's in scripture. Yeah, I, I do agree with this. And I, this is probably my next uh, tweet that I'll make. Um, your worship should look like the worship in Revelation. Ask, yeah. ask yourself if the worship of your church looks and feels and sounds like the worship in Revelation. If it's, contemporary music and meeting in a pizza hut where you're not even trying probably not holy cow do we have 635 people watching i'm mostly on twitter get out of here this is our highest viewed show ever wow <laughs> that's cool. we've never so, had that um so yeah, okay. it's like, would, you, I, would you ever would you ever get on a rap song with me dude <laughs> Uh, sure, why not? Serious question. Serious question. Would I would I love to see a. Bar? I would love to see a parody with you two working together. Even if he doesn't rap, if he does something with you we, to we, do a we parody should do together, we should parody something. We'll think of something. Do yeah, we have a mutual enemy, MacArthur. <laughs> yeah, and and I I've, I do make some parody characters like Saint Bigachungus of Kazakhstan, but apparently you didn't like that, so I won't do that. <laughs> Okay, so do you catch a lot of grief from Protestants for your, I mean, you're having conversations with Catholics now, you're having, I mean, you're going, you're going pretty far off the, what is acceptable as a Protestant in my, I mean, just from what I've seen, I don't know, I don't know the Protestant world as well, like, my exposure to Protestantism is literally you and Ruslan. Right, really? I mean that's I I really and do I, enjoy I, Ruslan. I know, I know Ruslan. I might be visiting him in California pretty soon. He's he's cool. Um, I know he's currently getting uh, solicited by the Orthos. So um, well, he just went to the Symbolic World Conference, which was yeah. Jonathan Peugeot's conference, and I love Jonathan Peugeot. Me too. Um, but I I I 
I made a joke the other day. I was like, oh, I think Ruslan's going Orthodox and Zoomer's coming to Rome. And he responded to it. He's like, I'm not becoming Orthodox. And I'm not going to ever. I've always been one week away from becoming Catholic ever since I've had any sort of social media. I say something like, hey, we should have stained glass in the church. And everyone's because like, it sounds very Catholic. Catholic. It's like when, when it comes to like these things, like how worship should look and the philosophy of worship with the kingdom of God and revelation. Yeah. I'm like in lockstep with Catholics on that, but there's also many ways in which I'm profoundly not Catholic. I'm an ecumenist. I'm an iconoclast for crying out loud. I reject the seventh ecumenical council. Um, we got to oh, fix that. All the modernist Catholics. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> We, we, we should we should parody something together we should do some sort of i have another important question are you a gamer yeah. a gamer <laughs> yeah are you a gamer you, you got a nintendo switch bro i don't use nintendo the only game i play is minecraft i run the christian minecraft oh, that's, that's, server. Still based. that's still based yeah everyone built churches videos, on the Mario? minecraft server no 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 no. i know he plays minecraft but gamer is a very specific question it's I'm a little a deeper gamer, no. than minecraft no. like you know we're getting on call of duty we're getting on you know what i mean my minecraft server has prettier orthodox churches than your minecraft server probably does oh no i 100 percent guarantee it bro i 100 percent guarantee it yeah i had a few questions i had a few things i had to ask you uh I guess, I guess, um, which came first, Minecraft or Christianity for you? Were you were, did you become a believer before the Minecraft or the Minecraft? No, my, Minecraft in middle school. Um, please, nobody drop this in the comments section if you know what you can, but please don't. In middle school, I was a Minecraft YouTuber with a hundred subscribers, and I just made really cringe autistic content. That's still on <laughs> YouTube, by the way. Uh, my, my dream was to oh, become a no. famous, famous Minecraft YouTuber like Stampy Longnose or whatever. And I still the the world where we build churches is the same Minecraft world I had in in middle school and stuff when That's I was pre awesome. when I when I was pre deemed Zoomer. That's awesome because my YouTube channel is the same YouTube channel that I made when I was a kid. I just like privated all the videos, but I had one that got like 40,000 views and it, it was all terrible. All my videos were terrible. I remember I made one video where I had like, it had like Chinese music playing in the background and I did really offensive Chinese accents trying to do Kung Fu. I had them in like eight. You guys won't and, uh, <laughs> and my mother, my mother was like, that has to go, son. She's like, it, it's terribly offensive. I'm like, why? You know, like I was offended. I'm like, this is my art. I look like a real sensei karate master. Why are you telling me this is offensive? And she's like, you can't go on there and, and, and make that mocking accent and uh, do karate moves and video yourself. It's embarrassing. You're going to hate Anthony it. Anthony did that as a 40-year-old in a Catholic I podcast. I did it on our channel, trying to yeah. impersonate a Chinese priest who gave me absolution. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, it was bad. I would be proud oh, no. if my, I'd be proud if my kids mastered the accents. Can you say dude for me? Can you say dude for me? Dude? What? Yeah, you say like dude. I noticed that in your videos. Yeah, yeah, he's got a little that. New York Guinea in him, this guy. I'm yeah, telling he's like, you. Dude, he's got that, 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 and that's that the one Thomas. thing when I made my parody of you. I for, I didn't think to put that in. I should have put in dude. I didn't do it. Yeah, the, the words that I say with a New York accent are like coffee and coffee. like mm -hmm. dog. Yeah, like oh. I, I can you pronounce, you pronounce my name. Can you pronounce my name for me? We have something we need to figure out. An old debate between Anthony and Rob. We need to see it. Could you could you just say Christian my name? What? Christian Mario. Oh, Thank you. Is Mario. Thank you. You're it's so Mario. owned, Anthony. It's Mario. Stop it. He says Mario. It's Mario. Um, wait, funny. what was your first video to to blow up, Zuber? My first, well, my first video to like sort of blow up was that church history video of mine. Oh, it was my first video to really blow up was my the all Christian denominations explained in twelve minutes. That mm. video, it's, I mean, I'm bragging, but it is the most watched video on denominations that there is yeah. in in the world, um, because I, I can't think very complexly i dumb things down so i apparently that appeals to a lot of people if yeah, i just I think explain things in 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 comic sans and i wasn't expecting that to blow up but it did so then i kept making videos in that style do you think you are going to do this as a career or are you do you going to do something else totally different this is just a little project you're doing on the side my everyone in my family 
would uh, crucify me if I ever say I'm doing this for a career. No, I'm getting a regular math job as a job, but it's a nice, it's a nice side gig. It's a nice side. I, I hate the idea of, ma- of making a ton of money off the internet and like making that your whole grift because it turns into something. It becomes no longer yours. It's no longer yeah. special. And I yeah. think the spot you're at, I mean, for being a big account, you do what you want. And you start to lose that once you really depend on it. Once you're, you know, you have wife and kids and they need food and that's your way of income. It totally limits you creatively and like to make fun content. So I think, I I don't think I'll ever do this as my sole source of income, even if we made enough money, because I don't want to depend. Then you become audience captured. Like you said, then all of a sudden you're just trying to say whatever's Whatever is going to appeal to the widest masses so that you can keep your big audience. and You become a drama channel is what you become. If you yeah. want to be a big channel, you need to just ankle bite and make drama videos. Like, you won't believe what happened, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I hate that type of content. So, I don't I, yeah, I did. I did. I had him in mind, but I didn't say the name. So, you can't, you can't put that word in my mouth. <laughs> I noticed, like, there's this meme where, like, channels with 1,000 subscribers do the most intricate analysis of, like, history. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then channels with 500,000 subscribers is just reacting to TikToks or whatever. No, it's real. It's real. I mean, like, I, I think that's why, like, I'm okay with making niche, more niche parodies, too, of, like, Paul Washer. Like, nobody cares about Paul Washer anymore. It's because I want to do what I want to do. And if I start, like, trying to, like, manufacture content that's going to be big, I just lose it. So it's like, I like being niche. I like being small. I don't want to be famous, you know? I, I like having conversations like this. Like, th- th- this is why we started our channel. I think this was one of the more fun conversations we've had in a while. It's very interesting we might have an opportunity to talk to some uh uh well never mind i won't say that we i want to hear, have... well, hear your paul washer accent sorry to interrupt but i want to hear you do a paul yeah. washer accent right now all right all right all right let me get in the zone friends <laughs> i'm here with redeem zoomer it's paul washer and friends i don't know if you know this but preaching is a perilous task and it takes bravery to do what I'm doing because if I say anything wrong about that Bible over there, I am a false teacher and a false prophet, friends. You got to get the crying going, dude. I'm, I'm a false prophet. I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't have to do it to get myself to cry. You didn't even tell me I'm going to hell. <laughs> Redeem Zuma. You are condemned, Zuma. Friends. Don't go down the wide path. It's falling apart. It's deteriorating. It's not well, as whenever, good. Whenever someone says, I feel like my faith isn't genuine, what should I do? Well, first I say, like, you know, you should talk to a real pastor, not me. But then I'll say, how much Paul Washer have you been listening to? And they're always like, <laughs> how did you know? It's funny because, you know, Protestants always say Catholics and Orthodox are the ones who are so like don't have any assurance of salvation. But I'll tell you this right now. There is no one with less assurance than a Reformed Baptist who just discovered Paul Washer. He he is so worried about his soul. I mean, I remember one of my buddies uh, went through a Paul Washer phase a couple of years ago and it got to him. It really got to him. Do do you hate your sin? If you don't hate your sin, you're not safe. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's real. And then he's like, look at your fruits. And then he'll name like some of the most impressive fruits, like St. Paul converting like thousands of people. And then he'll be like, look at your fruits. And it's like, I'm 17. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't done anything. I was in Peru. There are these, there are four year old martyrs in Peru. Would you be a four year old martyr? Yeah, no, he'll do that. He'll talk about, he was like, he was like talking about like, uh, I don't know, like maybe it was like martyrs in Egypt. And he's like, would you do that? Would you? And it's like, these kids are 14. No, the martyrs in Egypt who he thinks aren't saved because they don't affirm sola fide. They're not that consistent, though. They're not that consistent. So, thank God. Mm-hmm. Yo, the Protestant world's awesome. Dude, it's I came... Like the Baptists will be like, oh, there's three billion Christians and also Catholics aren't Christians and who knows what Orthodox are. And they'll never ever do the math. They'll never think about it. They'll never think... <laughs> that is pretty funny. I love that. Ba- Baptists can't do math. They don't. No, and Baptists can't dance, man. And I'm living proof. I'm well, living I can't proof. dance. I dance like an autistic monkey. I'm Presbyterians can't dance either. No, yeah, you guys are the frozen chosen. It's true. 
Yeah. It's true. I met a guy recently. Frozen Chosen. <laughs> Frozen <laughs> Chosen is what they call them, you know, because they're all chosen to Calvinists. They've been elect, predestined. And on top of that, they don't be bouncing around or jumping around or doing all the guitar stuff. They're 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 chill. They're really chill. Well, I was they watching a video stay. this morning. Uh I I I I posted a clip of this morning of like the charismatics going crazy and you know it was like uh like 12 <laughs> girls they were like 12 years old praying over this boy and they're all speaking in tongues and everybody's hysterically crying and i remember when i was a kid like 13 14 my parents took me to a retreat it was like a charismatic retreat it was catholic and everybody in the room is crying and speaking in tongues powerful and i remember going god do you not want me? Because I'm not crying. I don't get it. Like I want, like send me your Holy Spirit. Why am I not crying? Everybody here is crying, but me. I don't get. I thought God didn't want me. Like I almost lost my faith. Anthony, one time I went to an Orthodox mission parish in uh, in Florida somewhere, and uh, when I went in, you know, I went in. It's a very reverent, you know, just kind of normal liturgy. Everything's chill, and out of nowhere, I just hear. <laughs> I'm like, what's that noise? What's going on? And uh, it was in this apartment. It was a very small mission parish. And I hear all these noises. I hear all this screaming like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, what is going on? And the priest is just chilling, doing his thing, acting like nothing's going on. He's giving a homily and you hear horns in the background. And then I, I'm like, I guess I look scared. And this kid comes up to me and he goes, hey, man, don't worry. There's a Pentecostal church right next to us. <laughs> And he's like, and they have horns and they're going crazy. And he's like, so so don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Wait, Zuma, did you ever have any introduction to that realm, like that world of Protestantism? Well, you so you you came in, you I remember I heard you say on Trent your original baptism wasn't valid though, right? Well, my remember I said my parents, especially my mom, were like new age when I was born. So they're in this new age group, but they left it like right after I was born. So I wasn't like raised in that or anything. So there's this new age Gnostic group founded by this Austrian guy, Rudolf Steiner, completely heretical. They think that Jesus was a regular human who received the Christ essence at age 30, but it's, it's called the Christian community. So I didn't realize my baptism was invalid until I looked at the Catholic list of valid baptisms and that group was on the list of invalid baptisms. So I, I did some research in their theology and I'm like, yeah, I can see why they say the baptism's invalid. And then I got well, you see it on you see it on Twitter all the time, right? It'll be some celebrity getting baptized and they'll dunk the person that be like, in the name of Jesus, we baptize you. And it's like, uh, that's not valid baptism, dude. What are you guys doing? Yeah, I'm glad that there are, there's at least the unity of baptism between the denominations. Um, and Orthodox, aside from some radical ones, they would still affirm that Catholic baptism is valid, right? You know what's crazy is that I think. I, I actually was unsure about my own baptism because I knew that a pa the pastor that did it, um, I'd seen, I'd gone to my parents' church for some reason, and he skipped the, uh, he's, he totally skipped saying in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just skipped it, and just said, I baptize you, and didn't say anything, and dunked the person. And then he baptizes another person and does use the triune formula. Dude, that's like, was wild. That blue? Or why? This is why this is why non denom is sus. And there's some radically progressive mainline churches that will baptize in the name of like the creator, redeemer, and sustainer because they want to sanctifier like, the creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. It's they want to have like gender inclusive. I was on I this, think they're trying to be too special or something. I was on this uh confirmation retreat that that, that was when I first was first exposed to the liberalism of the PCUSA because my church was more normal. But there was this confirmation retreat hosted by the Presbytery, and my local Presbytery is the most liberal one in the country. And mm. that confirmation retreat was so liberal. There was a pastor there who denied the divinity of Christ. And when oh, we were, we're, that's it happened, that's that's why I say the Catholic Church is stable compared to us. Okay, well, okay, Zoomer, I didn't. I'm going to level with you. I didn't know you, that you guys meant that when you said liberal. I thought it was just like you know gay stuff and women priest stuff. I didn't know it was like denying no, that. God that, the that's the, that's just the beginning. That's just the symptom of it. There are, I mean, this so is still them don't even believe the Bible scripture. Then no, they they're straight up like, oh, the Bible's wrong. We we think the Bible's oh. like so. Okay, well, I I have this, there's I have this video where I say there's like five stages of progressivism. So 
a a woman priest or a, a female pastor is not as bad as a gay pastor and that gay pastor is not necessarily someone who denies the divinity of Christ, but there still are pastors who, who do that. And I was on this confirmation retreat and to have gender neutral language, they said creator Christ and Holy ghost when they were saying the doxology instead of father, son and Holy ghost. Um, they have one year. They need to all be deported. It's the only answer. The only solution <laughs> we need to, we need to launch them to Mars. Yeah. It's like, and, and I, I see them like there's these, Church is built for the glory of God. There's the achievements of Christians literally carved in stone. And these like based Christians, generations of based Christians donated all their estates to them. And now there's like literal atheist, lesbian priestesses um, standing in those temples. We can't let them do that. We have to kick them out. And that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I love what he gets his that's you what I'm trying to do over here, right? <laughs> Listen, we got six hundred. I, I can't have it. I can't have it. I got to kick them out. I can't be Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Listening to Anthony and Zoomer, it reminds me of watching Band of Brothers, listening to the New York Italians talk to the New York Jews. <laughs> well, I'm also, I'm also Italian like one-fourth, though. I'm everything. I'm every New York ethnicity in one. I'm Lithuanian. I'm Italian. I'm Jewish. Puerto I'm Rican? Dude, I'm, t I'm serious. When you come to New York, I really do want to take you to your first traditional mass. Just for an experience, man. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, like, I'd love we got to a see really, it. really great community. It's like right on the Queens border. It'll, it's like a 25-minute ride from you if you're in Westchester. But listen, yeah. we got 670 people watching, most of them on Twitter. If you guys are watching on Twitter, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Come on, knock it off. Um, all right. What, what else can we touch on before we, dude, I really think these conversations are very good and I think people enjoy them. I've never, we, we have one question that might just be fun. What is everyone's favorite Bible translation? Mario, what, what's yours, Zuma? What's your favorite translation? So the one I use most frequently, just the NIV, the message is not as bad as people think it is. It's goofy, but it actually is a pretty good commentary on the Bible, and it was written by actually a very based uh, conservative PCUSA theologian, Eugene Peterson, who's actually a very good theologian. So the message, I think, is the most underrated Bible translation because it gets clowned on more than it deserves. I've never heard. I've never even seen the message. Uh, okay, don't look it up. If you haven't seen it, don't look at it. It shouldn't be used as a serious translation. Yeah. It's a para It's not a translation. It's a paraphrase. But I think it's okay. a very good paraphrase. It's just it. It puts the um, it puts every Bible verse, even the Psalms, into like the goofiest boomer American language you could possibly imagine. Well, there's a cowboy translation. Like, there's yeah. actually a cowboy if you, translation. If you want to laugh, do everyone watching do this right now. If you want to laugh, read any Psalm in like your regular translation, and then read the same Psalm in the Message. In the message. Good, uh, I'm gonna look this up. What's a good imprecatory Psalm? When my girlfriend and I first started courting each other, we would do a Bible study together every day. And at the end of our Bible study, just to laugh, we would always read a psalm in the normal translation. And then give us one to read. I want Rob to pull one up. Right, I'm going to give you right here Romans 3 28, 29. No, 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 it has to be a psalm. The psalms here, have the. We're going to do an imprecatory oh, yeah, psalm. It has to be a psalm. All right, let's see, Rob. I want to hear let's one. See. Okay, let's see here. So this is Psalm 69. Which in might what? be 68 in the Dewey Reams. This is the message. No, uh, re read the normal. Read, the, read, the read normal. like uh, read okay. like the RSV. Read the RSVC or something first, and then read the message. Okay, let me look it up. Have two tabs side by side. Yeah, like for, for me, I'm reading the Dewey Reams, but I will also because a lot of it is like that, it's almost like the King James version where it's pretty tricky. So I'll my comparative would be the RSVCE2, it's the Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, the Second have Edition. You guys ever heard, have you guys ever heard of uh, the uh, the Jesus Book, the Hawaiian Pigeon Translation of the Bible? No. Yes. Here's John three sixteen because everybody knows that verse in Hawaiian Pigeon. God, when get so plenty love and aloha for that people inside the world, <laughs> that when He sent me His one and one only boy, so that everybody that trusts me no get cut off from God. But get the real kind life that stay to the max forever. <laughs> real. That's real. I read it. The, the cowboy version is just as funny as yeah. that. One. All right, Rob, you got it. Okay, so this is the Dewey Reams. Uh, it's Psalm 68 in the Dewey Reams, Psalm 69 in other translations. Save me, O, o God, for the waters are come in even unto my soul. I stick fast in the mire of the deep. 
and there is no sure standing. I am come into the depth of the sea, and a tempest hath overwhelmed me. So that's just the first two or three verses there. Yeah, Here's the I message. Mean, yeah. God, God, save me. I'm in over my head. Quicksand under me. Swamp water over me. I'm going down for the third time. I'm hoarse from calling for help, bleary-eyed from searching the sky for God. It's, it's kind of like a paraphrase in modern boomer English. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I never understood KJV only us until I heard about the message, and then it all made sense. <laughs> I am a message onlyist. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't admit to that on you, man. The the message is the only perfectly preserved translation. You can correct the Greek with the message, right? You can correct the Greek with my message translation. What do you, what do you think of the King James onlyists? I mean, I, I'm not a King James onlyist, but the King James verse that's the only sense in which the Baptists are trad is that they like the King James version. That's yeah, the it's kind of based. It is pretty based. The King James version is is sounds the best. It's the best for doing like poetry and stuff. Yeah, it's pretty interesting when you meet those people. Or, or, or there's that there's some Protestant groups that insist that if you don't call Jesus Yeshua, like, like, you know, it's like are, it's like no, talking, it's, it's are Yeshua. We talking, are we talking Protestant? Or are we talking weird evangelical? There's yeah, weird, weird evangelicals. There's we'll weird evangelical on. moms who think that if they if they say words in Hebrew, it makes them sound more spiritual. Guys, I am Hebrew. There's nothing special about it. <laughs> Jim, what do you actually think we evolved from that? Uh, I'm not sure if I did, but you definitely did. <laughs> oh, it's over. It's over. That, 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 that's that's the thumbnail that Keith Foskey designed for me. I uh, thought that, that was pretty funny, man. Yeah, no. That was pretty funny. I, no, I, I do believe that we all evolved from bacteria, and the Catholic Church does permit that view. That's they a good question, fellow Mike. No, no, no response. <laughs> I'll just have to take that hit on the chest, man. Um, yes, Yeshua is his name in Hebrew. Um, it's also Joshua, right? So Joshua, Jesus is the new Joshua. So like a lot of people will recognize that Jesus is the new Adam, but he's also the new Joshua. He's also the new Moses. He's also the and new Abraham. Joseph. He's ever and Abraham. He's the new. Yeah. Which is very interesting that, I mean, I, there's so few Protestants who actually read the Bible typologically. And Mario told us when he came on that Presbyterians are what introduced him to that. Well, Presbyterians yeah, yeah. have covenant theology. We have covenant theology, which is all about typology and drawing the parallels between the uh, Old Testament and New Testament. Very interesting. Uh, Zimmer, have you ever read Through Biblical Eyes? Uh, no, but also when you put on that hat, it froze, so it actually looked like Mario where the hat snaps on instantly. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, no, that's a really good book, and that, that book, I think, um, played a huge role in me uh, discovering orthodoxy uh, was through biblical eyes, and it was written by a Presbyterian. All right, so make sure no Catholics read that book. We there's a, there's a book orthodoxy. called like Through Western Eyes about orthodoxy. Is that by the same guy or something? No, no, no. This is by um this I, I'm trying to remember his name right now. I'm drawing a blank. Let me pull it up, dude. <laughs> oh, so oh yeah. So I was asking you before, do you catch any crap from Protestants for having conversations? James B. Like Jordan. This? James B. Jordan. Sorry. Oh, James, James B. Jordan. He's one of those weird federal vision guys. Yeah. So um do I catch any crap from Protestants? Some Protestants don't like that I affirm non-protestants as real christians there's some protestants who don't like that they tend to be either the more baptist types or the like super strict like um 1600s type presbyterians um generally the accusation i get from low church protestants and like pca type protestants as well as that i'm focusing too much on worldly things like beauty and institutions my response to that is kingdom theology. Yeah. Like we said, the gospel is the kingdom of heaven colonizing earth through the church. That includes institutions. That includes culture. That includes music. And it includes buildings. Yes, I said it. Buildings <laughs> matter. Um, they matter in the Bible. You guys like the Bible, right? They matter in the Bible. God cares a lot more about geographic locations in the Bible than modern evangelicals do. Yeah, but modern evangelicals 
they they say they believe the Bible and they say, but they're really saying I believe the Bible as interpreted through my pastor that I'm learning from is what they what they really mean because yeah, everyone has a tradition. It's like Baptist theology. It is a tradition. I just think it's sort of a, a, a wrong. It's one of the hardest things to explain to them is that they have a paradigm. Like they seem to think that they like approach the scripture as a blank slate, like in some like Lockean sense where they just read scripture and the words say what they mean and they're just reading it and there is no tradition. It's just the plain reading. And it's so weird because it's like you try to explain to them like everybody has lenses and paradigms they're reading through and it just doesn't compute. Uh, that was a conversation I had with a, with a friend of mine who's very biblical and it, it took him a long time to understand like, dude, you're reading the scripture through a lens. You have yeah. a lens. You have I think, a lens. I think ironically. You don't have to call it a tradition if you don't like. We can call it a perspective, but you have a perspective and you have presuppositions and they affect how you read scripture. I think ironically, um, maybe not, maybe that's the wrong word, but I think strangely C.S. Lewis through writing near Christianity created evangelical non-denominational Christianity. Really? Why? Yeah. Because he kind of writes the book and he gives like this, the essentials of being Christian. And he says like, this is the whole way, you know, everybody should find their own door. But I think a lot of non-denominationalism kind of is based off of that idea of just mere Christianity. Don't worry about this other stuff. You don't need all these trappings. You just need basic Christianity, which they derive from C.S. Lewis. I, it's just a theory, I would, though. I would push back on that because a lot of what C.S. Lewis says in mere Christianity completely goes against evangelical teaching. Like one of the things he says is like the apocatastasis, the, re the restoration of all things, that our faith is not about going to heaven. It's about heaven coming down to earth and transforming it. That's a very important mainline Protestant idea. And evangelicalism is super Gnostic. It's all about leaving the earth. It's all about escaping this sinking ship of the world. Partly it's rapture theology that influences that. But it's all about like they, as, as Bodhi Valkam said, why rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic? They think the world's a sinking ship and our yeah. goal is to save souls to get off this world. That's Gnosticism. C.S. Yeah. Lewis pushes back on that. C.S. Lewis says, um, we're not trying to escape and go to heaven. Heaven is coming down to earth through the church, we are to be a part of that. Oh, I'm glad you pushed back because that was just like a theory I had. I have no, no yeah, basis yeah. for it. The only thing is, too, is lower, like you're right about something. I think lowercase mc, I think lowercase mere Christianity, like just that idea the idea yeah. of reducing the gospel to gospel issues. I hate when people say gospel issues, it's like everything is connected. I think reducing Christianity to that that's what causes lowest common denominator Christianity. But C.S. Lewis himself is actually extremely based. Yeah, and so oh, no, all truth is God's truth. So it's not it's not just there's the gospel, and then you can have relativism on everything else. No. You know, that's it's not the way <clears throat> that we should approach it. Yeah, C.S. Lewis had a even an understanding of purgatory. If you if you read, um, yeah, I don't agree with him there, but I know that I know what he means. Yeah, but like if you read, uh, uh, what is it? Divorce, uh, the Great Divorce. Great divorce. What was it? A great divorce. A great divorce. Yeah. He's, I mean, his, just even the way he, like, he talks about that one woman who loves her son so much that she can't even love God because she's just so focused in on her son. It kind of just shows you how a soul can just, like, she's so, she would drag her son <laughs> to hell to have him. Turns out ecumenism is just dumping on evangelicals. <laughs> hey, we got to well, find I, some I respect, on common ground. I respect all denominations. Non-denominationalism is not a denomination. That's like Fair saying point. I like all types of food. So that's like, okay, then then you should like Burger King as well. Burger King's not food. So Yeah. All right, man. I think we're gonna wrap this up. I do have work in the morning. Dude, this was very cool of you, Zoomer, because mm. I mean you're clearly 10 like maybe a hundred times bigger than our channel at this point. What do you got? 400,000 subs. I think we're at 9,000. So it was very, very cool of you to come on and just hang with the, uh, the, the low, you know, the lowly YouTubers still. Hopefully you <laughs> build some treasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And, and I meant it. If you, uh, if you're coming to New York and you do want to check out a traditional mask, shoot me a DM, tell me yeah, when you're sure. in town and, and I'll take you. And if your girlfriend's in town, we'll, you know, I'll, We'll do like a double date kind of thing. I'll take you guys out to dinner and stuff. It'd be very fun. For sure. Thanks. You guys have anything to promote, Mario? 
I mean, uh, I feel like Zoomer's audience, it's too niche, but my parodies, I make parodies. I got 2,000 subscribers. I'm a nice little, tiny little baby channel. <laughs> if you want to subscribe to that, you can, or you can follow me on Twitter. I got a big account on there. And, um, yeah. And uh, Zoomer, you got, I mean, if, if you guys don't know who Redeem Zoomer is, I don't know what you're doing here, but uh, you have yeah, anything I think else to everybody watching so. Just uh, go to OperationReconquista.com. Look at the mission to retake the churches from the heretics. Would you ever play Among Us, Redeem Zimmer? Would you ever be down to play Among Us? I've never played it, but I'd be down. Yeah, I was thinking about getting you and Matthew Pearson and some guys and just playing playing some Among Us, playing some sussy Among Us Chungus. So. Let's do that. <laughs> All right, dude. Yeah, go check out Zoomer's conversation with Trent Horn. It was very much so more sophisticated than this conversation. <laughs> but I think I think this was a fun don't come here for sophistication. They don't come no, in this that's, Exactly. That's what I, I that's what I, I figured the, the, the conversation with Trent was very like analytical and you guys were like having very specific I think hey, this one would be all over the grandpa. place. Grandpa. <laughs> grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. Please like, subscribe if you haven't already. Share this show. We will be back uh, later this week. We're gonna leave it at that. We're not gonna say anything else. We'll, well be back. We'll be back Thursday with our Zoomer. Yeah, with our Zoomer, Nick Cavazos. Uh, it might be something else popping up this week. We don't know yet. We'll find out. Uh, all right, Rob, take us out, brother. <laughs>